Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, with a question for you. Yes, my dear audience, I want to know what do you think they're doing with your DNA? You know, the swab you sent off that 23andMe kit, you were so excited. You posted on Facebook that you're this much Scottish and you're this much French and you're this much German and how wonderful it was to connect with so many on that family tree. And, uh, you know, your friends are interested, your family are interested, but guess who else is interested? <coughs> Somebody you don't want to be interested, and that's Satan himself. Why would Satan be interested in your DNA? Because there is a Y chromosome marker that determines whether or not you are in the line of Aaron. That's right, Aaron of the Bible, the priestly line, the one who will return, be born into this world, line of Aaron, to take his rightful place in that lineage to head up the Sanhedrin that's going to call for the return of Jesus. Yes? Matthew 23, 37 through 39 says, Jesus says, I'm not going to return until Jerusalem cries out, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. There is a way to weaponize that DNA and take out that line, and if that happens, then Satan rules the earth. <coughs> That's what's covered in the pages of this book, The Codist. Now out in second edition, 14 weeks in the top 10 best-selling biblical thrillers, and can be available to you for just $2.99 on Kindle, also available in paperback. Visit Amazon, and the book is named The Codist. I also want to encourage you to visit our website, ignitinganation.com. Click on the yellow cover of my latest book, The Seven Laws of Abundant Living, Lessons Learned from the Tree of Life. Now, when you click on that cover of the book under Special Offers, we're going to ask you for your email address. But we're not going to send you spam because spam is not kosher. What we will send you is the first chapter of this book. Contained in this book is a journey from the natural into the supernatural, taking you from the ground all the way out to the fruit of the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. Seven foundational truths found in each one of the parts of that tree, revealing seven supernatural truths. Get your copy today, Kindle, paperback, hardback, even in Indonesian. It's my pleasure to introduce you to our guest this morning, Elise Fitzpatrick author of the newly released book, Finding the Love of Jesus from Genesis to Revelation. Elise serves the church as a writer and conference speaker, the author of two dozen books on Christian daily living. She's particularly interested in exploring the intersection between God's gracious love for us in Christ and our love for our neighbor. She's been studying the Bible since 1971 when she came to Christ and pens numerous blogs, articles, and books that strive to flesh out the depths of Scripture as it applies practically to the everyday life of believing women and men. Along with her family, she podcasts at Front Porch with the Fitzes, www.elisefitzpatrick.com, and Elise has a Y in it. Elise Fitzpatrick, welcome to Revealing the Truth. Thanks so much. I'm glad to be here. Elise, you talk about 1971, that you, uh, uh, when you first came to Christ, but that's not the year you were born. There's actually a pre-1971 Elise Fitzpatrick who wasn't even Elise Fitzpatrick back then. She was Elise, uh, uh, Elise somebody else. Uh, yes. Tell me, about, tell me about the influences, the journey to faith, how you got to the point where you ultimately became the Elise Fitzpatrick of today. Yes, thanks very much. Um, I was born in 1950 and grew up in Southern California. Um, for the first four or five years of my life, my dad was in the home. My father actually was a non-practicing Jew, and my mother was a non-practicing Catholic. And uh, they divorced fairly early on. And uh, so my mother raised my brother and I and pretty much worked nonstop. She worked sometimes two jobs. So really my brother and I raised ourselves. And when I got to be about uh, 12 or 13, I asked my mother, why are we here? And she said, uh, I don't know, honey. I think it's so that we can all learn how to get along. And I thought, no, that's pretty lame. So I just went ahead and decided, well, if that's all there is to life, then let's eat, drink, and be merry. <laughs> and that's what I did. 
And so beginning uh, really with my very early teenage years, I threw myself headlong into a life of debauchery. And whatever that means to anybody who's listening as far as the Southern California lifestyle, that's what I did. And um, by the time that I was uh, 20, I had had a baby, was married and divorced. And living with that little baby, my son James, um, and then the Lord came to me. And it was really interesting because it wasn't as though I was actually really looking for the Lord. We never really went to church very much. I mean, from time to time, we would go to the Lutheran church. Um, and I was actually confirmed in the Lutheran church. But I wasn't really, I wouldn't say I was raised in a faith family. And... Um, then right before my 21st birthday, a woman who remains my very dear friend, Julie, uh, I moved in next to her and she came over and started talking to me about Jesus. And then uh, fairly early on in our relationship in the summer of 1971, the Lord came to me. I found myself on my knees praying one night that God would reveal himself to me. I didn't know who he was, but... I knew Julie did, and uh, it's really been a, a journey of faith ever since then. You say your father was Jewish, but uh -huh. not, not practicing. Right. Uh, did you ever explore your Jewish identity? Of course, we look in Scripture that it was the seed of Abraham. Uh, during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, during the Babylonian captivity, uh, the definition of who was really an Israelite or a Jew transferred to the mother, then in about 200 A.D., it became kind of uh, the oral law that we would recognize a Jew as having a Jewish mother. However, the laws of return in Israel determine that if you have one parent or one grandparent on either side, that you are considered to be uh, of Jewish descent and therefore entitled to citizenship in Israel as a dual citizen. You can be a citizen of the United States and a citizen of Israel. Uh, when you write about uh, finding the love of Jesus from Genesis to Revelation, was there any part of you that really quickened from a Jewish identity or lack thereof, but yet became illuminated to you as to uh, your comment about eat and drink and be merry? Uh, it's a wonderful expression, but as a, as a Bible believer, uh, I look at it as eat, drink, and be M-A-R-Y as opposed to M-E-R-R-Y. And you have the ability actually to be M-A-R-Y, Mary, uh, because of your Jewish lineage. So you can identify with this, this uh, Jewish mother and the Jewish father, uh, God and uh, on earth, uh, Joseph. So did that ever pique your interest? Did you ever pursue any part of your Jewish identity? Um, you know, I did not, uh, I didn't pursue it uh, very much at all. And actually what you're saying to me is, is really interesting. Um, my father, my relationship with my earthly father was really estranged up until the last 10 years or so of his life. And it was at that point then that we were uh, reunited and I had opportunities with him. And uh, actually uh, in the last few years of his life, I went and uh, went and visited him and uh, asked him uh, about his relationship with God and uh, asked him what he would say to God if he ever would stand before him. And he said, you know, that's not anything I've ever even thought of. And I said, well, dad, when you're, when you're celebrating Passover, and I knew that he did, uh, what are you doing? And he said, uh, we're just having a party. So um, I don't think it meant much to him even, although at the end of his life, uh, as he was dying, a nurse, his wife actually told me that a nurse came in and asked to pray with him and that if he would want her to do that, he should just blink his eyes. And at that point, that's all he could do. And he did. 
So I don't know what that means, Rabbi. I don't know if that means he, uh, if God came to him, if he had faith. I don't know. Uh, but that was encouraging to me. Well, 2 Samuel 14, 14 says, Like water falls to the ground and does not return, we all must die. But God does not desire that. He devises ways for those who are estranged from him to return. And yes. so he will use people, places, things to reach us even in our final moments. And let me assure you that we serve a faithful God that will meet all of us. He met you where you were. He met yes. your dad where he was. And it is through the, the touch point of every person in our life that winds up being a contributor to our journey to faith. It doesn't always have to be out of the bottomless pit, out of despair, out of, uh, of desperate circumstances. It can be in the comfort of success. It can be in the comfort of whatever it is, wherever you are. And what's interesting is we all come to faith on the exact same day, every one of us. And that's the day we're ready. And it's not until that day that we're open to receiving or even hearing something. So it may have taken your dad's last moments for him to be open to hearing uh, what God's plan was for him for eternity. And his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And so the, the, w w we just don't know. Uh, you have become an avid Bible reader. And let me assure you that statistically you are among the minority. And, uh, you know, there's Barna Research, and Barna Research tends to be uh, North American church focused in many ways, not globally, but uh, what's the North American church doing? And <clears throat> we have two, two parallel illiteracy problems in America. We have the illiteracy of those who are uh, in poverty, uh, inner city, uh, challenges where parents are illiterate and pass that illiteracy down to their children. We find that 75% of all children who are in the system uh, are functionally illiterate and that their parents, 90% of those who are in the welfare system are functionally illiterate. Uh, we also find the same thing in the church, and the numbers are staggering. Uh, very disturbing to me of the levels of biblical illiteracy in America, uh, let alone um, uh, uh, even pastors uh, who have been surveyed by Barna and by Pew. Uh, confess that they don't read their Bibles much outside of sermon preparation. So what is this epidemic uh, that you have discovered? What research have you, ha has really stimulated you to embrace this? Because I'm going I'm to share with you uh, not only your book is the antidote, but that the listening of the Word of God, hearing the Word of God, which is actually the instruction. There's two instructions, study not read, uh, to show yourself approved, and faith comes by hearing and by hearing the Word of God. So you can actually listen to the Bible, uh, even on an app. Uh, Uversion is an app that has an audio feature to read you the Scriptures. The Hebrew Bible has the feature of reading you the Scriptures in Hebrew, uh, if you're a Hebrew understander. Uh, and you can read the entirety of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. You can listen to it in 70 hours. Seven zero. That's not a very long period of time. No, it's not. So what has the research shown, and uh, why do people struggle so much with this incredibly supernatural gift given to us from a place that we aspire to ascend to? And how to get there is contained in this roadmap given to us but we focus on the destination, but we have no understanding of the journey. We think it's one stop shopping at the Jesus store, and that's the beginning and the end. We, the price has been paid for us, so we do just go collect our free gift uh, for showing up. How do we get there? So um, I, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. There is a significant lack of Bible knowledge 
Bible reading, uh, particularly, as you said, in the North American church, that Barna poll, there is a Barna poll, the most recent one states that among people who believe that the Bible is actually God's word, um, two thirds of them don't even read it every other day. Now, of the group of people who actually believe that the Bible is God's word, two thirds of them don't even read it every other day. Well, there is a huge disconnect there. I think the disconnect happens in churches where uh, for much of evangelicalism, certainly not all, but much of evangelicalism has sort of untethered itself from scripture. And uh, so basically the sermon, the word that the people are hearing on Sundays is uh, how, to have a, how to have a great life now, you know? Uh, basically just um, life, life hints, life hacks for the Christian. And so that's a significant issue. There's also a problem with even among women who want to read the Bible, and particularly the Old Testament, they don't know how to read it to find Jesus there, to find the Son there. They don't know how to read it. And they read it as being sort of uh, morality tales. So in other words, I'm going to read Genesis and figure out what it is that Abraham did that I should do. And so that's part of the problem is that they're not reading it as anything other than morality tales. If I said that uh, there is more love and romance contained within the text of the Bible than there is in the sum total of all the Harlequin romances, uh, would that stimulate the uh, romantic side of women to want to read this incredible love story? Well, I think it would help. I think it would help, but I don't think that unless you're actually showing them, they are completely unaware that the Old Testament is, and, and actually the entire Bible, is a love narrative. But they're not, they've never been trained to see it. And so again, you know, all they see is morality tales. Uh, they read scripture as though it's some sort of magic eight ball. You know, like, am I supposed to move to Atlanta? And then they, you know, read the Bible trying to find out an answer like that. Um, and I mean, certainly, Scripture has wisdom to tell us about decisions we should make, but not that sort of personal revelation like that. They don't, I, I, generally speaking, just saying to them that it's a romance won't help unless you show them where it's a romance, you know, give them examples, let them grow to see it. You know, honestly, if pastors would preach Christ from the Old Testament, that would help a lot. But many don't. Many don't preach uh, the gospel from the Bible. They just use, view the gospel as something that they're going to reference at the end of their sermon about how to have a great life now. So many uh, that I have preached to, when I uh, cover the parallels between Isaac and Jesus, that the story of the binding of Isaac is the precursor, the foreshadowing, it's an identical story, point for point, to yes. the crucifixion of Jesus. It yes. is where we are revealed, the crown of thorns, it's where we're revealed, the Father's only Son, whom He loved. It's where we're revealed all of this, so that even for me, the Jew, it's clear to me that the Lamb, the Ram, who was the sacrifice and the, and the substitution for the redemption of Isaac and for the Jewish world, well, it wasn't wasted on me that it was not a Lamb, it was a Ram. I, it was an adult. It had horns, those horns, that ram was wearing a crown of thorns, and then all the other parallels. But what was so stunning to me in understanding the love of God, after I became a New Testament believer, 
uh, in, uh, a believer in Jesus 22 years ago was knowing a prayer called the Vahafta. The Vahafta is taken from Deuteronomy verse six, chapter 6, verses 5 through 9. You shall love, the Vahafta means to love. Uh, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. And these commandments that I give you today are to be on your heart. And you're, teach, you're to teach them to your children when you rise up and when you lay down and when you walk along the way. Now then, Jesus says, I am the way the truth and the life, no one comes to the Father but through me. Well, when we hear walk along the way, we're thinking the highway, the roadway, the sidewalk, the wherever we're going, wherever we're traveling, we should talk. But no, God makes it very clear. And if you don't connect Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 9 with the statements made in the New Testament, you don't understand any of it. You cannot connect the dots of the fullness of the singularity of not 42 authors of 66 books, but one author of one book, and that is God himself. It is the most supernatural gift that mankind has ever been given, but we try to overcomplicate it, and if we would read it and see this crimson thread that runs all through yes. Scripture, all through yes. Scripture, and that is the blood, the bloodline, the lineage, the thing that yes. feeds. It's like my body has veins and arteries and has a heart, and my heart is the Bible, and everything that works in my system feeds oxygen and nutrients and all those things from the heart, and the heart pumps the blood back out to feed all the organs, and everything processes it through it, and that is the Bible and the way God gave it to us from a natural standpoint to reveal supernatural truths. We're talking with Elise Fitzpatrick, author of Finding the Love of Jesus from Genesis to Revelation. The comments about this book are stunning. Elise introduces us to the way Jesus taught his followers to read and understand the Bible, which puts who he is and what he's done firmly at the center of every part of the Bible's story. My friends, my beloved audience, there was no New Testament at the time of Jesus. Therefore, right. in order to understand any word that he spoke, you have to embrace the script from which he read, the words written on his heart, Jeremiah 31 says, 31, 31 says, I will make a, behold, I will make a new covenant with the house of Judah and the house of Israel. It will not be like the old covenant written on, on tablets of stones, but I will write it in their minds. It will be in their hearts. What is he talking about? He's talking about this Jesus, this new covenant. And when Jesus says, I only say what I heard my father say, you have those words in your hand, available to you, available to anyone, you know exactly what Jesus is talking about because here's the words his father said. And he says, I only do what I saw my father do. If you want to see what the father did, you've got to embrace Jesus in the Old Testament and the love of God from the beginning to end. So many have said to me, thank God for that sweet, sweet Jesus because that God of the Old Testament was so heavy handed and so hard, but they were one. And you cannot separate the Father from the Son. And therefore, the same loving, sweet Lamb of God is the true heart of the Father. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to dig in to why it's all about Him, seeing what's right in front of you, finding the love of Jesus in the book of Moses, finding the love of Jesus in Israel's story, and all the way through till we have the most obvious representation, and that is the gospel message that talks about the love of Jesus. Elise Fitzgerald, Finding the Love of Jesus from Genesis to Revelation, will be with us when we return from these announcements. Back. Shalom. I'm the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, Executive Director of Ignatic Nation and host of the daily TV program, Revealing the Truth, seen live every Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Central Standard Time at www.ianbn.com and then replayed throughout the day and night via our website. All of our segments can be seen on the Igniting a Nation YouTube channel. Since our launch in January of this year, we've expanded our global reach to over 54 countries with a social media following of over 125,000. Our commitment is to bring you the most in-depth interviews with authors, subject matter experts, and thought leaders from around the world. 
We have interviewed guests from Israel, Brazil, England, India, and all across North America. All of our authors are featured on the Books and Media page on our website, www.ianbn.com. There you can find a direct link to the book you want to order, and we receive a small commission directly from Amazon. There is no cost to you for this service. In addition to our daily teachings and interviews, we make available to you the archive of all of the interviews on our YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram channels. Our live program is available from our homepage, and there is never a charge to you for any of this access. We made the decision long ago that we would remain a commercial-free resource that would not be influenced by any pressure from any outside company. There are only two ways that we are able to continue to operate this ministry and provide you with the only live, four-hour daily Christian television talk show program. The first is through your support and tax-deductible contributions to Igniting a Nation. These can be made directly through the donate button on the website or sent through the mail to Igniting a Nation, 2700 Corporate Drive, Suite 120, Birmingham, Alabama, 35242. The other way we support the program is by offering you a unique opportunity to have access to over 10 years worth of teachings on a subscription basis. The teaching archives contains all of my prior sermons, Torah studies, prophecy in the news videos, and much more for the low subscription price of $5 per month. This subscription grants you unlimited access to over 800 hours of content not available elsewhere and is updated weekly with the most current prophecy classes. In addition to 20 hours of original TV programming each weekday, we invite you to join us live every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday evenings for our Prophecy in the News classes. The times and locations are listed on our events page on the website www.ianbn.com. Every day you and I are faced with the challenge of where we will go to hear the truth. We are committed to bring you the only program of its kind that covers the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. We cannot do this without your support. Since we launched on January 5, 2017, we have aired over 300 individual teachings, interviews, and commentaries not available anywhere else. We are now working side by side with almost every major Christian publishing house to bring you the most in-depth feature interviews possible. Our one-hour features address every subject that affects the believer's life. We are hearing of salvations from the Middle East, Africa, and all across the United States. Lives are being changed every day, and we have only just begun. Our mission is to become your trusted resource and grant you access to the people, tools, and information you need to grow in your relationship with the Lord. You can help us by liking us on social media and through your financial support. We know you have many choices in who you support, but we are prayerfully asking you to consider helping us keep revealing the truth, true to our calling, to cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth like no other program available. Donate today and help us bring the message to the four corners of the earth. Visit www.ianbn.com and donate, buy a book, or subscribe to our teaching archives. Without you, we do not exist. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Elise Fitzpatrick, author of Finding the Love of Jesus from Genesis to Revelation. Elise, welcome back to the program. Thanks so much. So here it is. The Bible's right in front of us. The love of God is right there on the pages. We've allowed people of scholarly pursuit. Uh, we've allowed the rabbinate. Uh, we've allowed the priesthood uh, to kind of create an environment that says, listen, if you don't have a master's in theology, if you don't have a doctorate in divinity or theology or in messianic studies, messianic Judaism, uh, you're just not, you just need us to tell you what you need to know. And uh, we're going to spoon feed it to you on Sunday because you would choke if we gave you much more than two verses and a bunch of anecdotal 
uh, stories to go along with it. And so we've dumbed down Christianity to the point where it has become undignified. And I use the word undignified in terms to uh, you and I are very, 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 very close to the same age, and both of us want to uh, die with dignity. And that means to be able to feed ourselves and take care of ourselves uh, without the assistance of others and slip on into eternity without a whole lot of, of uh, uh, fanfare. Uh, but yet, we go to church on Sunday and allow us to be spoon-fed uh, just those scriptures, and then we think that if we eat one sandwich, one half a sandwich, one really six or eight bites of a sandwich, that that's going to nourish us for the entire week until we return to the church. Why do you refute that notion, and what tools do you put in our hand uh, illustratively uh, in your book that helps us get out of that cycle? Thank you. Yes, I completely agree with you that the level of teaching that is given to most Christians uh, and basically that they really only get on Sunday morning is really pretty deplorable. It's that um, knowledge, understanding of Scripture is uh, I've heard it said that knowledge and understanding of Scripture in the United States is 3,000 miles wide and a half an inch deep. You know, it's just it's just not there. And to talk to people and say to them that the Old Testament, basically the New Testament is just the end notes of the Old Testament. It's just uh, it's just and over and over and over again the New Testament writers said because they were steeped in the Old Testament scriptures. The New Testament writers continually said that it might be fulfilled. This is what this is talking about over and over again. And of course, all the disciples had on the road to Emmaus was all they were aware of was the Old Testament. The New Testament, of course, hadn't been written yet. So what I tried to do was begin at the very beginning and talk about creation, how in creation God looked at everything that he had made, including the woman, uh, because I'm very interested in getting women to read Scripture, read the Old Testament, and looked at the woman and said, this creation is good. This is good. And that uh, he would come, and uh, I, I think it's appropriate to say that the Lord, if that was the second person of the Trinity, would come and talk with them, walk with them uh, in the cool of the day with the man and the woman before the fall. They were used to that. And that was because he loved them and wanted to be near them. And then, of course, we have the fall. And at the fall, you have the Lord coming back. And again, I'm concerned about women knowing that the Lord ha loves them. The Lord, first of all, honors the woman by even speaking to her, uh, even in the curse, because he doesn't just say, oh, well, you know, I'm done with you. I'm just going to talk to Adam. He actually speaks to the woman and then gives to them the Proto-Evangelion, the first um, declaration of the good news. And the great thing about that is that it's through the woman and it, through the seed of the woman, which, you know, is very way, a strange way to put that. But through the woman would come the one who would crush the head of the enemy. And so from the very beginning, women were part of God's plan of redemption and that uh, even though, yes, Eve did sin, but Adam was there with her, uh, even though they fell into sin, God's plan was to bring to all of, to, to bless all nations through the seed of the woman, who, of course, is the Christ. You know, it's so interesting that people say, uh, oh, the book of Genesis, that's the story of creation. Well, only one and a half chapters of the 50 chapters in Genesis are devoted to creation. The other chapters are devoted to genealogy, to lineage, to the, 
to the uh, story of Cain, to the story of uh, the line of, of Noah. Uh, all this to establish from Noah to Shem and protection for the line of Shem uh, all the way through to the line of Judah, further looking at the lineage so that everything that happened happened to protect the line that would bring in the Messiah, the lineage of David, uh, the line of Judah. And uh, we see some fascinating stories in Genesis of love. One of the preeminent messages of love is the way God used uh, uh, man's first choice would have been uh, Isaac, would have been Esau, would have been um, uh, Cain, uh, would have been uh, Rachel, not Leah. That was always man's first choice. But God's first choice always wound up being uh, the second. It was Isaac, not Ishmael. It was, it was Shem, not Ham or Japheth. It was uh, Leah was the, cho was the one God chose, the one rejected by man, accepted by God. Jesus was rejected by man, accepted by God. There are all of the archetypes, all of the foreshadowing, all of the, the scriptures leading up to understanding who the seed of the woman is and understanding that this oldest prophecy of the Bible, we embrace half of it which is the Jesus half. We forget that this battle in this world we're living in is heading to a confrontation with the Antichrist. And Jesus spoke about all that. But if you don't follow the entirety of the prophecy and the entirety of Scripture, as he weaves this, who the enemy looks like, what he looks like, as we look at how, how Satan enlisted Pharaoh, how he enlisted Haman, and then Herod, and then Hitler, and what's going on today with anti-Semitism and trying to wipe out the line of the Jews, as my, my book, The Codus, tells you that there's a plot to take out even the line of Aaron so that the pre high priest never comes back and Satan rules the earth forever. He's been told in this prophecy, uh, here's your death sentence. Here's who is going to crush your head. And here's how he's going to do it. It just doesn't tell you the when. So we can read this incredible story of the stays of execution and how Satan worked to enlist at the kings of Israel to worship false gods, how he had the nations break apart to worship false gods, how he finally took and destroyed uh, the temple, not only once but twice right, because of our disobedience. And so this is a love story that is said that even in love, I'm, I'm doing everything possible to get you to the point, even over the course of now almost 6,000 years uh, of understanding the love of God. And we've been given chances like Israel was given chances over and over and over and over and over again to accept the love of God in his terms, not our terms. And that's what's so fascinating is you've helped us understand as we navigate the book in his terms. So when we find the love of Jesus in the book of Moses, uh, in the books of Moses, uh, it's kind of interesting that uh, we say in Hebrew, Vezot HaTorah, Aser Shomashe, Lifnei B'nei Yisrael, Apiadinai, Biad Moshe. This is um, the Torah, um, which is, is uh, the book of Moses given to the children of Israel, written by the hand of Moses by the word of God. So Moses was just a scribe. He was just one to inscribe the words of God. And Paul writes in his letter to Timothy, all scripture is God breathes. So it is not authored by man, it is scribed by man under the inspiration of God and the Holy Spirit. Most often in the prophets you read, write this down and tell the people this. So how do we find the love of Jesus in Israel's stories? You know, one of the stories that I find really uh, interesting, and yeah, this is again back in Genesis, is um, the story of Hagar and Ishmael. And so here we have Abram and Sarah, and she hasn't had uh, Isaac yet, and so she gives Hagar 
to uh, Abram, and then she's, uh, Hagar is pregnant, and so she leaves, and uh, God finds her, um, and he finds her in the wilderness by a well. My point in this, first of all, is to say that God looks, and again, I'm very concerned that women don't view the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, as being misogynistic but that God would come to this girl. She is an Egyptian. She has no rights. She's uh, been sexually abused. She's, um, uh, she's alone, and she's pregnant. And there she is in the wilderness. But the Bible says that the Lord came to her and gave her uh, words of a prophecy that would at that time comfort her that her son Ishmael will be of course uh, a, a man a, a wild donkey of a man and everybody's hand would be against him and um, but that she would be okay and her response to seeing God the Lord in that um, at that circumstance was she called him a God who sees her and cares for her. So she names the well and she says, truly here, I have seen him who looks after me. And that's so important, I think, for women who are in situations where they feel like they're powerless. Maybe they uh, are, uh, maybe they're pregnant and they're not married that what I want to say to them is that the Lord will come to them and they need to look to the Lord that he's not going to take them and just throw them away. And she's the first person, this is interesting, I think, as a woman, that she's the first person who actually gives God a name, calls him something uh, in Scripture. And of course, we have that sort of repeated throughout Scripture. But a woman is the first one who does that. And it's an Egyptian, unwed, pregnant slave girl who's in rebellion. Um, and actually who will give birth to Ishmael that names God and she names him a God of seeing and caring. So this is an expression of love. Uh you obviously have spent the last uh, 37 years digging into the scripture and come to the realization that uh, there are some faulty ways that the Bible is being read. Correct. Uh, in order to help us find out what the right way to do something is, it's, it's often said that good judgment is learned through bad experience. How can you help women navigate uh, and avoid the pitfalls of some of the faulty ways that the Bible is being read? Right. Well, one of the ways that Scripture is being read is that it's all of the Old Testament is prescriptive rather than descriptive. And what I mean by that is that frequently women will say that the Bible is misogynistic, um, that uh, the God, particularly of the Old Testament, hated women, uh, you know, and then they get into the whole story of, well, it's because of the, you know, the deception at the fall and all of that business. But rather to understand that the stories that we have, and particularly the ones in which we see women treated in ways that uh, we would object to, is to understand that the Old Testament in particular is descriptive. It says, these are the ways that fallen people treat one another. And this is why we need a savior. So what we have then is uh, men who will uh, abuse women or who will um, maybe marry a number of wives. And um, rather than saying, yeah, see, that shows that, you know, God doesn't care about women. No, actually, what that shows is that everyone needs a redeemer. Men need a redeemer. Women need a redeemer. We all need a redeemer. And that just because something is 
shown in the faithful narrative of Scripture, it doesn't mean that God is saying, yeah, this is, this is the way it should be. What it means is, is that we need a Redeemer. You know, as you describe this, all that jumps into my spirit is, is, my goodness, three Gentile women are in the line of Messiah. Uh, Rahab, Tamar, and um, um, Ruth. And Ruth. No, well, right. And Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah. Right. That's how she's referred to. So when, when we look at this uh, lineage, it's all about women and their role and being truly immortalized within the memory of anybody that studies the New Testament, looks at the lineage uh, of Mary, and it's the only time that a woman's lineage is given in the Bible. It's usually always the man's lineage, but God did that for a specific reason because both of them converge back to the line of David so there can be no refuting that whether or not you're a believer that Mary was the mother, Joseph was the father, however you want to get there, whatever you want to believe, God set up a path of connectivity all the way back to David regardless, and it's the only time we see that where they converge into the line of David so there can be absolutely no uh, question that he's from the line of David. Uh, but women are really quite edified. Uh, you have not only... Um, uh, Bathsheba, uh, Rahab, uh, Ruth, uh, Tamar, um, you have uh, Deborah, you have Yael, you have um, I, the, the number of women in the Bible and the Old Testament goes on and on who God edified and who God put in positions to secure the redemption of, of Israel. Esther, of course, an entire yes. book devoted yes. to the one who would wind up becoming the savior of, of Israel. Uh, th this is stunning that there is this deception. And what that does is that's the enemy's way of distracting people from embracing the truth of God. Uh, we want love stories. We want promises. We want the good life. We want all of that. Can we find that in the pages of, of uh, the Bible from Genesis to Revelation? Uh, this underlying theme of love. It's, it's much clearer in the Greek uh, expressions uh, which are really given in a Jewish context. Uh, but the simple statement is God is love. And so it should be really easy for us to see the love of Jesus all the way through the scriptures. Well, you know, it should be easy if we had been trained to look for it. And you know, that was the problem. The problem that most, I think, evangelicals in North America have, because they are uh, unfamiliar with the Old Testament and haven't really been taught to read it, as, the, as a redemptive narrative. Because of that, um, we're very much like, and in some ways, the disciples on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24. Jesus had to come to them, and this is, of course, the day of the resurrection. This is Resurrection Sunday. And Jesus came to them, and they had left Jerusalem and were walking to Emmaus and uh, were sad. And so, of course, a stranger joins them and says, what are you talking about? And they say, well, are you the only person who doesn't have a clue what's going on in Jerusalem? And they talk to him about the one that they thought would be the Redeemer. And, of course, their thinking in saying that was they thought that what that meant was that Jesus was going to get rid of the Romans right then. Um, and they said, but now the Romans have killed him. Are you the only one who doesn't know that? And then Jesus, at that point, opens their minds to understand the scriptures so that he goes back into the Old Testament. He does it with the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Uh, and then, of course, they have 
Uh, they have dinner together. He is known to them in the breaking of the bread. And then he goes back on that same day to Jerusalem. They go back to Jerusalem and meets with the disciples and opens their minds to understand the scriptures. And then in Luke 24, 27, it says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning themselves. Could you, guys, concerning himself, could you imagine what that conversation was like? It would have been so wonderful. And what Jesus did with them, uh, with those two disciples and with the rest of the disciples later on in the day, was to open their minds to understand. And they said, didn't our hearts burn within us when he opened to us the scriptures? And when we saw him in the scriptures that we've known all along, but see, what they didn't understand was suffering came before glory. Mm -hmm. They didn't understand that. They thought glory was going to come right now. Amen. And, I understand. And, and so that was, that was their problem, and I think it's our problem today. I completely agree with you. Elise Fitzpatrick, author of Finding the Love of Jesus from Genesis to Revelation, rather than just identifying the problem, she develops a solution for you that it is not long in depth or burdensome, it is not heavily academic, it, it guides you to a deeper understanding of what to look for, questions to ask. At the end of each chapter, there are wonderful items for further study for you to be able to fill in the blanks to find out why you should embrace the old and the new, the one word of God written by one author, God himself. Elise Fitzpatrick can uh, uh, be found at elisefitzpatrick.com. Elise, thank you so much for joining us here on Revealing the Truth and opening our eyes to the truth of the Bible and the love of God in every page of this incredible book. Thank you, Rabbi. It was my privilege. God bless you. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.